I'm sorry, Tom, I just had a bad experience once as a photographer. I got fired because I just couldn't stay focused. So please continue. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, uh, <laughs> we, we stopped for that, huh? <laughs> yeah, yes. And wasn't it worth it? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Encounters USA with author Matthew Hines. If you're looking for alien incidents, Bigfoot brouhaha's, or dogman dealings, we have the podcast interviews, field research, and field interviews you're gonna love. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and check us out on Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Encounters USA. I have a wonderful guest on the podcast. I have Tom Cantrell. Can you believe it? He is one of the senior statesmen of the Bigfoot community, and he has got so many encounters. He's got so many things to talk about, so we need to get going as soon as possible. Right now, Tom is working on getting his camera set up, so we um, are going to wait a little bit for him. And while we're waiting, I just have a couple of basically administration uh, housekeeping announcements. First of all, I am running for the office of governor for Washington State, and um, so that is going to not affect our our show schedule too much, but um, it will affect it a little bit because, of course, I'll have to be out doing speeches and, and all the things that go with campaigning. So it might really um, help you out to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you have notifications of when I will be uploading the next podcast. And um, other things that we have to announce are is the uh, Bigfoot uh, Yakima. It's the Yakima Bigfoot Yakima Valley Bigfoot Con, and that is on April seventeenth and eighteenth. And another reason that you might want to hit that subscribe button is that I have a competition with the She Squatchers, and if I have more subscribers than they do. Come time for the uh, Yakima Valley Bigfoot Con, then um, they have to buy me breakfast. And I certainly don't want to buy them breakfast. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button and um, support me in my channel. And uh, go to uh, Heinz for Gov and you can support me there in my campaign for Washington State, as well as see all of my programs that I plan to Im- implement as soon as I am in Olympia. All right, so let's see how Tom's doing. Tom, what's what's the prognosis? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Encounters USA. Today we have the legendary Tom Cantrell. Tom is a Bigfoot researcher, and he's a Bigfoot author. Today we're going to be talking about some of his encounters with the big guy, and we're also going to be talking about Tom's extensive library of books. We're going, he, we're going to get a little bit of background on why he decided to write them, what they're about, and then we are going to talk about encounters Tom has had both in the Olympic National Park in Washington State as well as encounters in California. So, Tom Cantrell, welcome to Encounters USA. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Good to be here. Uh, I, I do want to correct one thing. My encounters are not limited to Washington and California. I've, I've had encounters, encounters from Alaska and uh, Canada and uh, Washington, Oregon, California, all the western states. Uh, I've been at this at this 62 years, so I've gotten around a little bit. Um, and my favorite places are Blue Mountains of eastern Washington and the Olympic Peninsula, uh, two of the most fantastic areas in the world, and add to that uh, southern B.C. Okay. And, uh, we did a study up there that was fantastic. Yeah, and um, so you you chose these as your favorite areas because of the uh, bi- because of the Bigfoot activity, or just because of the just because of the what the area has to offer. Both actually, actually, uh, 
the area has to offer a lot in order to entice me. But uh, there's no reason to be there if there's no Bigfoot and no Sasquatch activity. Right, especially... And the, the Olympic Peninsula is ripe with that. And uh, Alaska is ripe with it, so is so Canada. And the Blue Mountains are the same way. That was my home. I lived in Tri-Cities, Washington for 30 years. And so that was my backyard. Okay, so and I don't have my... I don't that's have my... where I met my teacher. That's... Okay, and we're going to talk about your teacher in a little bit, but um, you're over in eastern Washington. Are you, are you a Cougar fan? Are you a Washington State Cougar fan? Uh, no, I'm not. I, I My degree was in logging engineering, engineering from University. Washington. Oh, no, I we don't. Purple and gold. No, Tom, we don't say that on Encounters <laughs> USA. We don't talk about the other <laughs> university here. I may have to just um, may have to edit that out of this podcast. So you mean our, you talk, you're talking about the University of Washington or the stepchild over on the east side there? No, I'm just talking about anything that has to do with <laughs> UW. And in fact, the, I saw in the news the other day that um, they are actually putting their uh, diplomas in their rear view uh, windows or in their rear windows. Did you hear about that? Uh-huh. Yes, I no, guess. So. I didn't. Yeah, so they can use the handicapped parking spots. So, so I it's. See, I see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. That's a way do, home. Do you know what the WSU's uh, graduate says to a UW graduate? Uh, more you shine those fries with that burger. Nah, ha, 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 ha. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yep. Well, thank okay. you. Have thank- we covered the? Uh, <laughs> have we covered the rivalry well enough yet? <laughs> nah, well, I'm just gonna have to do a lot of editing. That's all. When I when this is all said and done. All right, Tom. We'll <laughs> let's get down to uh, business here. So, so Tom, you are pretty much uh, what we would call an elder statesman in the Bigfoot community. You've been doing it, as you said, for 60-some years. And the only people that could really compete with you... 62 years. Yeah. Only people that could compete with you are uh, like Bob Gimlin. So, um, so no, you... I'm old, I, I, I've been at it longer than Bob. Okay, okay, then I guess your competition is reduced to zero. So one of the things that you have done, Tom, uh, uh, along with your research and your knowledge, is that you have attempted to spread that knowledge through uh, pretty much an extensive library of books. So let's just go over very quickly uh, your books and uh, just give us a brief description. And let's start with uh, The Ghosts of Ruby Ridge. The Ghosts of Ruby Ridge was my first book. And uh, when I started out to write a book, I wanted to tell about Sasquatch, how they live, especially, and uh, what motivates them, how they work. But I wanted to do it in a way that the haters couldn't hate. <clears throat> well, Tom, because can I stop you right me. there? Can I stop you right there? Because I've heard uh, I've heard that expression from you before. Who are the haters, and what do they what do they hate? Um, you know, I'm not sure what all they hate, but they hate new knowledge. Number one, they hate anything that that tends to upset their apple cart. So okay, but are, are we talking you about people who, normal and but people who don't who just like they're not scientists they just think there's no Bigfoot and so they're they're um, yeah that, it goes beyond that even Matt um, they, they not only think there's no there's no Bigfoot but their world will not allow there to be a Bigfoot okay so does that cross into the Sasquatch. Does that cross into academia then? That those are the also some of the it does does cross into academia, and mm-hmm. also into cler- clergy. Okay, um, you know I and and said, you know I hold the priesthood myself, so that's not a valid argument in, in my case. Mm-hmm. Um, but people's their beliefs are such that they can't allow anything other than, you know, if it doesn't say it in the Bible, it never happened. Right. Uh, the, the, the earth is a thousand years old, and that's all. So there were no such things as dinosaurs. And believe me, those people exist. They're still a flat earth society. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you know, Tom, can I, you know, we, I, I'm uh, sorry to, I think we have kind of a lag here. So I, I seem to be 
stepping on you, but okay, so when we're talking about like the, I assume we're talking about religious conservatives and what they've done with Bigfoot to incorporate Bigfoot in is to start talking about a Nephilim aspect of that. So does that run into any conflict conflict with what you know and what you've perceived? These are these are not really Nephilim from the Bible. No, no. They're, first of all, Nephilim is not a word that's even in the King James ver- version of the Bible the Bible. That word came from apocryphal text. Mm -hmm. It is not in the King James Version, and the King James Version is the only only English version that is absolutely acceptable. Mm -hmm. Everything else has been translated from that Mm -hmm. to fit the vernacular that the person doing the translating wanted to to connect. If you read uh, Genesis chapter 6, it talks about about the God coming from heaven to earth, taking woman to wife, and there were giants in those days. Okay, if that same thing that the King James version, if you read the same thing in say the New World Translation, it says the Nephilim came to earth. They were mm-hmm. fallen angels. Okay, there's nothing in the original Bible about about fossils having anything to do with that mm-hmm. okay that's all man made up mm-hmm. as far as I'm concer- concerned Ephlam does not exist as a biblical source okay and if you look at the concordance in your King James Bible it does not even list list the word Ephlam hmm. okay what they are they're a human hybrid mm-hmm. period Okay, well, we're gonna we're going to get into all of that, and if anybody knows what they are, Tom, it's it's going to be you. But I just wanted to touch on that because one of the things that we run into, depending on the geography of where our guests are from, the farther south you go, the more likely you're going to hear uh, the Nephilim story. And uh, it's really funny because it, it it usually comes from the same place as where the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, originated so um, so it's definitely a very interesting topic but we're going to so let's talk about the ghosts of Ruby Ridge you um, so we've talked a little bit about that um, you you want to say anything more and I just want to point out that it's got nothing to do with the uh, Randy Weaver or the separatists or the neo-nazis of of Idaho so what exactly is the no, ghost of Ruby Ridge the Ghost of Ruby Ridge, again, as I started to explain, I said it in a novel so that those anti, for any reason, uh, uh, didn't have anything to argue. Uh, if they didn't like what I said about Sasquatch, I, you know, hey, it's a novel. I can write what I want, you know. Um, I set the, the book in northern Idaho because of that area well, and I've had experiences there. Um, it is set in the Ruby Ridge country. That's what, that's what the hen and doesn't mean, you know, Casper. We're mm-hmm. talking about shades of, uh, memories of, okay, uh, of the Ruby Ruby Ridge. And basically it's a story about two hunters that come, you know, that through a mistake, end up killing a Sasquatch, and one of them gets ad- ad- abducted, lives with a Sasquatch family for, uh, for a period of time. And so you get an in-depth view of how their families system works okay. uh, that's that's Ruby Ridge that's the ghost of Ruby Ridge uh, excellent story I love the story and like I say it was my first book um, I that back in the early in the 21st 22nd whatever century we're in now 21st century and uh, fun thing about that I finished the book and then I spent the next seven years getting it published wow. I had a lot of credentials at as a magazine writer, but I had never written a book before. And I had probably well over a hundred rejection letter and letters, from people who had never read the first word I had ever written up mm-hmm. on any subject, mm-hmm. just simply, you know, uh, that will do. I can't, uh, you know, this, this, and they hadn't read anything of it. They just sent a rejection letter because it didn't fit their parameters. Yeah. But I persevered. Me seven years, and I finally got it published. 
now it's a whole lot easier because I formed my own publishing company, mm-hmm. um, and I I do it. But uh, but uh, that was. And I always ask people, how long will you hold on to your dream? My dream, my goal, goal to see that book in print. The fact that it's been highly successful is just a plus. But mm-hmm. it was getting it into print that was was my, that was my dream. And I held on to it. It took seven years, but I got it done. And I urge anybody who has a dream. So, yeah, because it, it, I would think that you're probably the major um, obstacle you had was the title, The Ghosts of Ruby Ridge, because, I mean, that's the time that there was the Randy Weaver thing, Randy Weaver thing going on. So anyway, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you finally got it published because it is a fantastic book. Uh, fantastic story. So is there anything in that book, Tom? There is the account of the guy in 1924 that was uh, supposedly abducted by a Bigfoot family, but then he escaped. I, I, any of this stuff based on real real stories, real anecdotes? <clears throat> it, the, in Ruby, Ruby yeah. Ridge, is, is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Uh, uh, stuff I don't really like to go into or okay. don't want to go into. Okay. Went to, uh, yeah. There, uh, much of it is, is based on, and and much of the one of the characters is autobiographical too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I kind of leave that open as to what's autobiographical and what's uh, fantasy. But uh, so so that's for the reader to, reader to decide, I suppose. Okay. So let's move on to um, Sasquatch speaks. Okay, the the uh, are you talking about uh, works? Yeah, your book Sasquatch Speaks. Okay, it, that is a uh, that is a compilation, a report on our five year study that my two partners and I did in British Columbia on glyphs and structure, structures. Uh, basically, I teamed with Brian Bland, my research partner. And on that book, and some some of the chapters are his, and some chapters are mine. But basically, the th- three of us, Brian and I and Sue Funkhauser, worked together, f- together for over five years, studying the glyphs in an area up there, and uh, just had f- fantastic, absolutely fan- fantastic things happen. And we learned so much. Uh, one of the major things we learned about glyphs is that if they are for you, for you, you will know immediately what they mean. Mm-hmm. If they're not for you, you're reading somebody else's mail and you won't, don't have a chance. Mm-hmm. Mainly because because uh, if they're not for you, you don't know the context. Mm-hmm. And if you want to understand that, take the word B-O-W and, t- and tell me what it means. It could be a ribbon in the hair. It can be a bend at the waist. It can be the front end of a ship, or it can be somebody to launch arrows with. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you don't know the context, you have no idea what the word means. Mm-hmm. Okay, same thing with their glyphs. If you don't know the context in which in which it's used, you have no chance of translating it at all. Mm-hmm. But if it's for you, if it's left for you, you will know that context, and it, and it will make sense to you. So, Tom, beyond that, oh, you've identified. Beyond that, we've identified certain genre of glyph, of glyph, a depression glyph, a signature glyph, that sort of thing. And though that's a general classification, a general category, and that works well. So, but Tom, we had some oh. amazing things happen up there, mm-hmm. and and the, that's chronicled in that book. Okay. Um, Tom, can I just uh, jump in here very quickly? Now, the glyphs that you're talking about, I met you at the Marble Mount Bigfoot Conference in August last summer, yeah. and yes. you were giving a presentation on these glyphs. Is is that what we're talking about? The, the exactly. stuff from your presentation? Okay, because that was absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yes. Really fascinating stuff. It, it is a fascinating field. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, and okay. the way they appear sometimes is fascinating. fascinating. Uh, an example, I was at a gathering down on the Oregon coast, and <clears throat> the third night night there, uh, we got a 
and walked outside of our tent and underneath the guy line for the tent was a glyph that had been there before you know three days and it hadn't been there then one day there it is in the morning mm-hmm. you know overnight it was it was placed there mm-hmm. so, uh, so Tom the neat thing is yeah. when we when we started nobody was even using the word glyph <laughs> nobody in nobody in the in world, uh, even bothered to to look at them or look for them now uh people across the country are in the, are investigating uh op uh, leanne carnegie and south and southern ontario just is doing some fantastic work with glyphs and stru- structures so uh, mm-hmm. i really highly suggest anybody that is interested in this subject look her up and uh, and get a look at look at her site i think it's called without borders on facebook uh, great work uh very well documented uh great great video work tom could you repeat that name again at worst this skype is just kind of stepping on itself sometimes so i didn't get it would you repeat her name uh-huh. Uh-huh. her name is leanne carnegie okay and she's uh known as southern southern ontario sasquatch okay and uh she has she has a very unique situation there and it's very well, very much worth looking into. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk. Well, all right, let me just ask you this because I might forget as we go along, but from and I, I will have your I have a bunch of your pictures of your glyphs on on file, so I'll be posting them with this interview so people can get a look at them, but you know, doesn't that I I mean obvious the answer is obvious, but you are basically saying that these sticks arranged in the right in a, in a pattern, whatever, that these represent uh, symbols that represent some kind of writing or a, a symbolic language of a Bigfoot. So when we were talking about the haters before, don't you think that that really opens it up to people that say, well, you just did that yourself? Oh, <clears throat> uh, oh yeah. Then, uh, and you'll never get rid of those people. The mm-hmm. difference is... Uh, uh, when they're attacking me at this point, uh, they're leaving somebody else alone, and that other person might have trouble with that. And I simply don't care what they think, any- yeah. think anymore. Yeah, I know. First cause... of all, nobody's ever proven to me that they that they that they do think. Even you know uh, these glyphs, glyphs. Unless I watch them being made, and I have seen them make some. Unless I watch it, I cannot say a hundred percent sure that it was made by them. Mm-hmm. But we, and one of the things we learned over that five-year study was the clue, other clues to look for to raise the probability of being created by them. Mm-hmm. Now, I, in that five years, I have well over 25,000 pictures of, of glyph. Of that 25,000, I have actually shared less than 100 because I, of that 100, I am over 99% sure that they are Sasquatch created because of the other clues that were with were mm-hmm. with them. Okay. Now, again, I can't go to 100% because mm-hmm. I didn't see it being done. But if they're less, they're less than 90%, I've never shared with anybody. But the, the 100 or so that I share commonly, I'm over 99% sure. Mm-hmm. So the first the first thing, I'm, and the first thing I tell her that wants to object, well, that could have just fallen out of that tree that way. Yes, it, it could have just fallen out of the tree that way, but it, but it didn't. And here's why: we developed this set of this criteria, this set of criteria, criteria to to pre- the oper- the chance of that happening. Okay. Uh, we, it, you know, it was. I have a scientific background, and I know how to do a scientific investigation investigation and i would like people to understand that uh, i do that in fact is true okay so tom if i read this book am i going to have a, a basic understanding of a bigfoot language what's important to them what their what their symbology represents is that going to be in the book am i going to be able to understand more about bigfoot and yes you will be able to understand more about bigfoot it will not it's not a it's not a not a uh, 
primer. A book to translate yeah. with. Okay. Yeah, not a primer, not at all. But it will uh, give you some insight in, insight into their how they think and how their lives run and what they do. First of all, you know, the first thing that we met was the objection that they even thought they could, you know, we, you know, we even thought they could do such things. Mm-hmm. Well, it took some time to, to come to that conclusion, and we didn't reach that conclusion on our own. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was, uh, what it was fellow, what they call First Nations in Canada, what we call Native American, which is a total misnomer, nomer, because... Uh, Everybody in this country that's second generation is a Native American. Uh, <laughs> the fact that the fact is they just caught an earlier boat that they did. Um, so you know, uh, I, I still tend to follow the Colum- Colombian uh, accord and and call them Indians with no disrespect whatsoever. I, as a matter of fact, respect them greatly. Mm-hmm. But uh, but. Uh, but you know it's it's just a matter of semantics mm-hmm. at that point. But you have to understand, you will learn things about them in general, general, but very little in specifics. We don't know that much specifically at that point about that facet of their life. Mm-hmm. All right, Tom. Well, let's go on and let's talk about the search for a new man. The search for a new man is is a compilation mainly of encounters and some of them are mine starts with back in the 70s when i first started having encounters through the the 70s 70s were a very active period because i spent 90 percent of my time in the woods 90 percent of my life was lived in the woods <clears throat> i was running a logging company i was a forester doing consulting work as a forester and that's where i got to see them mm-hmm. uh, well, when I was logging or, or any of that activity, too much noise, too much activity. And if you take your mind off what you're doing when you're in that, that position, they carry you out in a basket. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, your mind stays on, on your job. But as a forester, I had, I had time when I, one of the things I did a lot of was uh, I contracted to do bridge site surveys in my home <coughs> state, state. If you're going to build a bridge across stream used by anadromous fish runs, such as salmon or steelhead, those that migrate to the sea, you have to have a permit from the state. In order to get that permit, you have to map the stream. You have to, you know, water flow, the bank types, the soil soil type, um, everything, you know, high water marks, and, and have a design for your bridge. And companies would have would hire me to go in and do that um, do it in the weekend and have it back to them and they like that so that that put me in the woods on my own quietly in old growth timber mainly um, or very mature second growth and I would hike in sometimes four or five six miles to get to the point where the bridge was going to be built mm-hmm do my measurements, do my study, and then hike back out and do the, do the drawing and uh, submit the report. Well, what I found out early on is to make that hike, then come back out, sit there drawing and find out you've forgotten one measurement was not fun. Fun, because you had to hike that five, six, seven miles back in again to get one measurement. So I would sit down at the edge of the bank and do a drawing just enough to make sure that I had all of the measurements I needed and then I would uh, leave leave. during these times that I started seeing them they would uh, they'd sneak up on up on me and be peeking around a tree at me I was sitting back in the middle of the woods all by myself they I figured out they're very curious individuals. That's how I began seeing them. That was my first encounters. Okay. Well, let's let's um, not stand on ceremony, Tom, because we're gonna. I need to come back uh, to those encounters when we start talking about 
your book, um, The 21 Days to, Te- to Destiny. But um, before we reach that, let's talk about 70 Years on the Mountain. What, can you give us a, a quick uh, rundown on that? Yes, 70 years, 70 years on the Mountain and Whispers from the Mountain are two of the same genre. They're a collection of essays I've written over the years. Some of them were designed designed as magazine articles. Some of them were uh, standalone. Some of them were part of other. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Yeah, I have the same problem. I think it's my the coronavirus or something. <laughs> I don't know. I've got something in my no, throat. Don't too. even say that. <laughs> but uh, the, it's a collection of essays of life. About half of them are Sasquatch related. The other half are just life. There's some essay essay in there on when I was four years old and then some happened. There's an essay in there on my first girlfriend in high school. Uh, you know, it's just things that, ha- things that happened in life. Um, I hope they're all interesting. I sure tried to make them that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's even a couple of uh, couple of essay, essays in my days in the Navy, the nine years I spent in the Navy mm-hmm. and uh, life on a submarine. And uh, so, you know, they're just a variety variety of, but there are some awfully good uh, essays in there too mm-hmm. how i met my teacher that we alluded to earlier is in there uh, it's one it's one of them and some some encounters uh yeah it's they're both excellent reads and mm-hmm. they're kind of a thing that you know each each chapter is 10 to 8 just so for if you have a few minutes to kill you can read a chapter read an essay and then move on there are essays in there on vision, on what we see as compared to animals, why they can see in the night and we can't. Uh, there's essays in there, in there on why you can't take a good picture of a Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and very basically, if you take amateur equipment with amateur photogra- photographers and try to do professional work, what are you going to get? You know, uh, you, you know, I was did work as a professional photographer and. And the first thing to learn is you never, ever use automatic settings on your camera when you're doing uh, commercial work. You you have to control your light. You have to control your focus entirely. You don't leave that up to the camera. Yeah. That, in a, in a nutshell, is why you don't get, don't get a good picture. Uh, it's going to focus on the biggest thing it sees. And uh, that's not always what you want focused. Yeah. Well, that reminds also, me of a bad experience. Is a, uh, yeah, and that's that's those those two book two books uh, together constitute that. Uh, some of those essays are thirty, forty, or fifty years old, believe yeah. it or not, but they're still timely today. Wow, not quite as old as me. Uh, amazing. All right, so here's the big one, Tom. <laughs> Twenty one days to destiny: uh-huh. the real story of Bluff Creek. What? This is the this is a history of the Bluff, Bluff Creek area in Northern California. It starts in eight with the Jerry Crew incident. Uh, Jerry Crew was a cat skinner working for a, a road building company, uh, Ray Wallace Construction, and they were subcontracted to a to a fire and uh, building road in the Bluff Creek area, which is in far northwestern California, California or. Uh, they were in Del Norte County, which is the most northwesterly county in California. And they were working, it was 20 miles by bad road off of the paved road, which was bad road, from, which was 20 miles from the nearest town, town. So they worked in camp, They, which meant that they camped out during the week and went home on the weekends. And... They came to work one morning, and around their tractors were a set of tracks. I believe they were, uh, uh, oh, my memory escapes right now, 15-inch, 15 to 16-inch tracks that came down off the mountain, up the road, around the cat, and then on up the road and over the bank. Uh, Dr. Ivan Sanderson, who was a noted, world well-known paleontologist, Paleontology, uh, author of 13 books, uh, the uh, 
held five doctorates, very well known, very intelligent man, intelligent man came up and he did the investigation. And uh, he published some articles, True Magazine, Argosy Magazine, both both carried articles on on his in early 1959. And it was this that got me started. Okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> but Tom, Andrew, just, oh, like, can I ask you, the, oh, I just wanted to ask you very quickly, um, when you get into... Uh, like Steven Spielberg, even um, there is a guy named Ray Wallace that was um, he was the publisher of a magazine called uh, I think it was Amazing Stories. And that's where Stephen King got his uh, Amazing Stories ideas. Some of these are our guy named Ray Wallace's. So I just have the question um, and I'm, I'm sure you don't have the answer. But is this the same Ray Wallace that is in um, has a construction I- company? Because that would be really weird. I don't think so. Yeah, uh, because yeah, it would be it would be utterly weird. And I know that the Ray I'm talking about passed away, living just south of Centralia, Washington, mm-hmm. and uh, was not uh, was not not well he actually at all. Yeah, uh, and you know he went he passed away with fake Sasquatch footprints foot. Pardon me, in yeah. his garage. So hmm. I don't think he ever varied from from his basic tenant. Was he but, a Was uh, he a small he, man? He was, tried because Ray Wallace in uh, the, on the Amazing Stories was no. he's like five foot tall. He's very he's a tiny. Oh no! Okay. No 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 okay. no. This fellow was so was six feet or better. Okay, not the same um, guy. Yeah. Um, he. Uh, he, when he got on the job, we found he was having after this incident, he was having great trouble, uh, be, because he couldn't get the crew. This uh, was scary. Scared, scared his crew, and they kept quitting on him. The only ones that didn't quit were the were the Indians from the uh, nearby res- reservation. Their attitude was, "What? Well, you mean the white man's finally got around to looking at this? You know, uh, it just amused them." them but uh he couldn't keep a crew on job so he started faking footprints and his footprints if you look at look at them and i have pictures of them uh are so patently fake Mm -hmm. that anybody could see they were Mm -hmm. they don't compare with what jerry jerry crew with the prints he cast at all okay but he could say oh i did that that's my you know that's Mm -hmm. just fake stuff and and that, try, that, you know, if you prove one fake, doesn't that prove everything that's ever happened in that field fake? Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the theory. And uh, so that's what happened. Tom, Bob did, did you... His basic tenant. Did you know Ray Wallace? Did you ever have a chance to talk to him? I knew... I never talked to him, but I knew him, yeah. What do you think uh, is... And I wh- never, never cared for him. What were his motivations for doing that? Very simply, he couldn't keep a crew. He needed to keep a crew, and once he started, he couldn't stop. Okay. And uh, well, the problem is, the Jerry crew found his first set of tracks on the 25th of August, 1958. The, the newspaper article came out on the 6th of October, 1958, mm-hmm. And until the 4th of October, 1958, Ray Wallace was in Eureka. Mm. If he tracks between the 25th of August and the 4th of October, he did it by magic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. He but, wasn't, even, wasn't even in the country. Yeah. He had, he had gone to Costa Rica to help them with get their logging system going down there. There. Yeah, and then as you alluded to that, um, the, then once he started saying, well, or once they realized they were fake, then they're all fake, right? And I, I think that really speaks a lot to human right. to human um, psychology that if there's something out there that is not accepted as normal, we're just waiting for somebody to come along and say that's not 
what you heard is not correct. Even if what they're telling you that is not correct is correct, you're more willing and more likely and happier to believe something that keeps your world the way it was uh, compared to um, some new information. Yeah, Yeah, we don't like our Apple card upset. And uh, even the people people who, who should be looking to new things, looking for new things, don't. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know, Tom, I'm gonna we're gonna just jump off of your the the book topic for a second because there's some issues here that I really think need uh, to be looked at uh, um, as far as behavior of these uh, creatures. And so um, the first thing I want to ask mm-hmm. you is there is um, you're out when you when you are in Washington, you're out constructing roads, or you're out helping, you're mapping, you're. Uh, talking about or you're doing research on these streams because these roads are going in now the uh and just bear with me for a second the bigfoot in uh california when they're doing building these roads they were very curious about the machines and they seem to be able to associate the machine what it did with the road which i I mean if you're a dumb animal you're not gonna even do that um, and, and one example that I, I cite is that they threw, they took the, the drums of fuel and they took these very heavy tires and they tossed them into a gully. So obviously exhibiting mm-hmm. that they knew what was going on. They knew what was happening here and they knew somebody was encro- encroaching on their territory. Is all that, is all that reasonably correct? At reason. Reasonably so, but one thing you have to remember, it only happened in particular areas. But yes, they did. They took uh, excavator tires and, and and threw them back. Full full 55-gallon drums of diesel fuel, and that's over 700 pounds. Yeah. Uh, um, pardon me, it's said it said seven pounds per gallon. That's mm-hmm. almost 400 pounds mm-hmm. of fuel, and threw them down the canyon. This was only in areas, and I believe, personally, it's it's because those roads were going into a, into an area that was sacred to them or important to them, mm-hmm. and they didn't want that access. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, uh, the, and as far as general area, general you know construction, they never bothered it. They mm-hmm. might check on it, might keep track of it, but it never ever bothered. Them. It's only particular roads going to particular places that upset them. Okay, now are you ready to? put on your rabbit ears and jump down the hole. Cause I'm going to ask you something that's kind of odd. Do you, um, do you recall, this, All right. do you recall the story? And I don't know who it was, but some researcher had been in Washington in the Olympics and they were out knocking on trees and they didn't get anything. So they went home and it's to Oregon. As soon as they got out of their car, they heard the return knock. Have you heard that story? No, I haven't heard that one, but I've heard many very similar. Okay, well, that's that's kind of what I'm getting at. So, you have in the nineteen late 1950s, 1960s, you have uh, these Bigfoot that are encountering construction crews in uh, California, and in the mid 1970s, Tom Cantrell is out surveying for bridges to cross streams. Do you think they knew what what you were up to? I mean, if they have the ability to communicate from Washington to Oregon, if you believe this story, do they have the ability, these guys that are watching you, do you think they understood this guy's here, they're going to make more roads, and that's why they were curious about you? Oh, absolutely. 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 I think they're more intelligent than we are. Uh, I think, and also, I think what one of them knows, they all know. Okay. Uh, at least among the 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 elite of their of their class the, what i call the teacher class um uh, i'm quite sure that or that what one of them knows all of them know in that class i think it's a, a, a i hate, hesitate to say hive mentality <laughs> but at least it's a common mentality so is it telepathy do you think i don't know how they do it mm-hmm. they do it i know that they use telepathy uh, they use it with me, but mm-hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that everything they do is telepathic. Uh, uh, I know they also have language, uh, you know, an audio language, 
uh, Ron Moorhead, prime example of that. Listen to his material. Yeah. And and uh, but I also know they can communicate in other ways, and not all of them can use telepathy. There again, I think we get into get into that teacher class again. Uh, in an in that I had this chronicled in one of the books in 1978 in Northern California, in the same area, same area actually, as Bluff Creek. Uh, and again, we're, we kind of got off the subject of 21 days, but that goes back, goes back to that area again. And <clears throat> I had three of them trying to communicate with me at one time and, and didn't do it. I could mm-hmm. not make anything out of what they were saying. Now, maybe it was my fault. Mm-hmm. Maybe I wasn't ready to receive or didn't know how to receive. But I felt no inkling of, uh, of telepathy at that time. Now, I go back there in 2014, and yes, it's very strong. And I was able to receive messages very well. So what's the difference? I think the difference was it was a different, different individual. Okay. And probably different class of individuals. Okay. Well, here, all right. So let's, um, I, I want to talk about the uh, existence of like a purebred and a hybrid, but um, that might have these uh, telepathic abilities. But before we do that, let's continue on. Okay. So that's 21 Days uh, to Destiny. And that's the story of uh, Bob Gimlin's and the original um, encounters. Yes. It get it 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 is and it gives the full story, not only of what led up to it, the twenty days they were there, there before they had the encounter, mm-hmm. and uh, but it also the trip the the ordeal they had getting out of there, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they nearly didn't okay, and uh, not many people know that story of what happened after mm-hmm. after the uh, they did the had the sighting and then you know cast the tracks and and did everything and then the next day tried to get out it was uh it was har- it was harrowing to say the least mm-hmm. but they did it for them obviously and <clears throat> and all this book also talks about the Sl- Tom Sl- Tom slick expeditions in the 60s and they're quite a quite a system going there he was a Texas oil man very wealthy and uh had crews, you know, doing research all over that, that area. Um, had well-equipped equipment yards, all the latest innovation toys, and all came to a crashing halt in 61 when he died in a plane crash. Uh, of course, the funding went away. And that's how, uh, if you know the name Peter Byrne, that's how he came to be in this country uh, he was brought in here to to oversee that organization and what he did when he came in first the first thing he did is all the Canadians quit and went home uh, <clears throat> if you knew John Green the newspaperman from Ag- Agassiz uh, BC uh, Lake area uh, Harrison Hot Springs he, uh, he absolutely hated hates Peter Byrne and I know why uh, I've had conversations with him and Peter Byrne has spent a lifetime he's one, he's one person that has been in this as long as I have uh, the difference is in all of his years years he has five footprints that he's seen and that's all mm-hmm. he's never had an encounter never had a sighting never heard a, a vocalization and, but yet he's made a career that he's written books on that mm-hmm. without knowing anything. Mm-hmm. And it kind of irritated the, the Canadian contingent, and they just went home. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Green, Rene de Hendon, uh, and to, to his dying day, John, John Green wouldn't, issue, wouldn't utter Peter Burns' name even. So uh, <laughs> that's probably enough said about that because anything from there would be here's hearsay but but that's that those are the parts i know because i've interviewed both of them Mm -hmm. all right well that's um i i did not know uh much about that i have uh 
um, uh, uh, nice, uh, Todd Nice, um, Todd Nice. I keep Todd saying Nice because, yeah. yeah, um, he got me, uh, Peter's book. I've had a chance to, to skim it over a little bit, um, but I was not really aware of, you know, the politics, the politics of Bigfoot. So that throws a little bit more into the mix. And the last thing before we leave uh, Bluff Creek behind, and yeah, I'm really interested in what happened to those guys, but I don't want you to say anything about it. We want to keep uh, people interested so they'll pick up that book. But mm-hmm. the last thing I want to talk about in the mm-hmm. in that Ray Wallace, um, uh, what the, the road building encounter was that, these um, Bigfoot, they seem to understand that the construction was tied to the equipment and the the tires m- made the equipment move. And the diesel had something to do with the equi- with that thing being able to move. Now, if you're just a dumb animal or even a dumb human being uh, and you've never seen one of these things before, you might think it's like an animal and how you can associate... And, you know, they must have been watching, and I'm just trying to think of the thought process, but you're watching these things move, doing their work, and another animal would think it's an animal, but they were able to put together that the the animal's legs are those tires. You get rid of the tires, and it can't move, and it's drinking that stuff in that barrel. So if you get rid of that, then that thing doesn't move. That is very critical thinking. That is is amazing critical thinking. and it may be a stretch too, because because uh, you know th- those things were portable. The the D eight cat was not. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, even with their with their strength, pick up a D eight cat, mm-hmm. but they can pick up the fuel. And yeah. the tires that they that they slung were were spares. They were sit were sitting there, you know, just waiting need. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was portable. It was movable. Okay. The important thing to remember is those things were not, were not rolled. Down yeah. the road, they were carried. Mm-hmm. There are were no tracks indicating they had been rolled in any way, shape, or form. Now, now you got to remember that that's only part of what on the the uh, story in the book will will flesh it out. But they brought in trackers, professional trackers. They brought in people with dogs. They brought you know uh, professional hunters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ray Wallace did all of this. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it was quite a quite a quite a story going on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really worth knowing. It it really sets sets a state game. Uh, you know, nine years later with Bob and Rogers film, and then 2014 when we returned there, and everything that everything that happened to us there, mm-hmm. uh, where we had I think we had, I think it was seven face to face sightings in 12 days. We were there, and wow. And, uh, and yeah, it was it was a fantastic. I would love to be able to go back again, but you know, due to agent agent infirmity, yeah, uh, where we camped was was thirty four miles off the paved road, and the, believe me, the the paved road is all that good mm-hmm. itself. So uh, it, getting just getting there would be a problem. And it's high elevation. We were there in June, June and. Ice would form on your tent, and the water buckets, uh, water containers in camp froze over every night. Uh, we're high at high elevation, so uh, it's 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 not for not for the weak. And I'm afraid that I have to classify myself as that as that now, unfortunately. All right, well, we're gonna after we get done talking about your books, Tom. We're gonna go back and talk about those California encounters, because those are very interesting, especially along the lines of looking at behavior. But let's just finish up here. So we've got, uh, I think we are down to my Marnie's story. Marnie's Marnie story. story. Uh, one of my, one of my favorite books. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit how, how this one started. I, uh, had a friend, Julie, who had a friend, Marnie. And she, Julie, thought Marnie and I would make a great couple because we liked the same things. We, you know, liked the same type of life. Marnie lived on the Clearwater River in Idaho, and uh, so she was doing her best, her best to play 
The problem is Barney's 34 years younger than I am, and that's just too great a gap. But she was a wonderful person, a gorgeous girl, and uh, we talked a lot. And one night as we, as we were hanging up on the phone, she says, write me the story of our first date. First date. And so I did, and that's chapter one in Marnie's story. But from there, it morphs from what you might classify as a romantic encounter, encounter to the story of a strong woman, how she copes with life, and how she comes to know Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. And and this one's a bit, a bit, or quite a bit, about their healing properties, uh, uh, propensities. And uh, it's a good story. I just, I, I really love it. It's not been as big a seller as the others, but it's still one of my favorite stories. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds you are, that, you are so uh, diverse as far as your your ability to write different kinds of books. Well, they all have you know I have different story stories to tell, mm-hmm. and the Sasquatch theme is is universal, and I just have to weave that into these novels and. And, I, and again, I do that just simply so that the haters hate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, they, uh, well, so you said such and such, and I'm in total control there. Mm-hmm. I could have made that neo Nazi colonel and go to Ruby Ridge gay, and he couldn't have done a thing about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm in control. That's one nice thing about writing is you, the thing you are in control of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, and, and, Again, I'll tell you, the the Sasquatch are, are constant. The book uh, after Armageddon, I did the same thing. I wanted to t- to tell about life in in their colonies, how they take a mate, you know, what their what their family uh, uh, procreation qualities are, how they do that. And I knew well, actually I had the book written, absolutely written, and. And my said, don't publish that. He said, the haters will tear you apart on it. I said, okay. So I wrote the novel after Armageddon and put that information in it. Okay. The people to whom it's important will understand it. They will mm-hmm. see it and they will know it. They, they will know it's truth. The story is a pure novel. It's a story about what would happen to our Earth today and the people on it if an asteroid the size of the one that did in the dinosaur 16 years ago were to land today. Okay, it's a story of survival of of, of basically tribal groups reforming and trying to survive in a time when nothing works anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's you know again, it's a good story, but the underlying uh, creations with Sasquatch are what make it. That's what. What, that's why I wrote the book. Mm-hmm. That's my job. What my teacher wants me to do is share share information. That's why I speak eight, eight, ten times a year mm-hmm. and go to, to talk with people to make myself available to people so that I can share what I've learned over, over six years. All right. So um, you, we've talked uh, pretty much about all of your... Bigfoot books, as far as I know, you have across the wide Missouri, um, and across West... the wide Missouri. Go ahead. Oh, oh, the wide Missouri is not a Sasquatch book. That's a, an historical novel uh, talking about the first uh, mountain men and their relationships with the Indians uh, at that time in history. The, was totally different. There were no Indian problems in the West, West, with the white people because there weren't any white people. Mm-hmm. And these mountain men came west. They lived with the tribes. They be, they were adopted into them. They married into them. Them they became, you know, light skinned Indians is what it, what it amounted to. Now, uh, that changed when, when it came easier to go west. And the easier it becomes, the more riffraff comes. And that's where the problems came. Mm-hmm. came with the mountain men. Okay. Uh, that book is, is a novel in, the, in that it's told through the eyes of a fict- 
fictitious person. Mm -hmm. It starts out with the story of of you last, and you know you. I've a, a lot of it. Of it is through the eyes of Jedediah Smith that came from his personal journals that I have, mm -hmm. and uh, I have copies of. Uh, you know, it's factual, mm -hmm. but through the eyes of a, of a uh, fictional person, so, so it's historical fiction. But it, again, it's a fun story. It, it's something that starts in 1821 with the Ashley Henry parties, the first party to go up the Missouri River, the uh, great shiny mountains, the stony mountains, and uh, how they got along with the Indians, how they lived, uh, right on through that period of history from 1821 to 1841 when it, that era was pretty much done. They the uh, the fashion in Europe went from beaver felt hats to uh, silk hats, and that killed the the fur industry. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, it's lucrative. I mean, if young men with no education could make the equivalent of a fort mm -hmm. fortune, uh, and many did. Uh, people went on from there to become founders of states, even. Mm -hmm. Even uh, Wolf Skill, Ben Wilson, went on to California, became Mexican citizens at that time because California didn't didn't fall into our hands until 1847. But uh, they just uh, they built the land mm -hmm. with the money that they made as strappers. Yeah. And also, well, anyway, you, you you know probably more about it than I do. But as a as a student of history, um, I I think that there's a lot of uh, very um, a lot of very ironical uh, situations that happened, and um, you know we see it uh, in every pattern of settlement, and it doesn't have to be with whites. It it happens in every culture where you have a, a superior culture that has a lot more people um, that come in and the people who they contact find advantage in their technology. But that technology comes with a cost and the technology eventually uh, er uh, erodes their culture. And I just think it's, you know, one of the sad notes of history that the Lewis and Clark expedition was saved by the Charbonneaus and uh, Sacagawea and um her uh her brother was a was a um ne per se and, and and they saved them and they were the last tribe they were chased all over uh Idaho, Washington and were trying to make it into Canada before they finally surrendered but on that surrender on that day they probably said boy I sure wish we wouldn't help these guys out yeah it's really um yeah Kamiya weight was uh was Lemhines uh uh, Le Lemon Shoshone, mm -hmm. uh, not Nez Perce, but uh, but your point is valid. They did. They the Nez Perce saved that expedition, mm -hmm. um, and what they did to them was at atrocious. Yeah. But the fact is, whenever two societies meet, the more advanced society will subsume the lesser advanced society. Mm -hmm. The American Indian's way of life was doomed the first time he received something something he couldn't make for himself mm -hmm. the first steel knife that he got the first steel pot he got doomed his way of life yep well, you could say because the same he could thing not produce that himself any, if anyone you could say the same thing with us uh, with the television or a tv dinner so Absolute, all, all right or, or this the cell phone yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it just goes on. All right, Tom. Well, let's. Um, so we've we've covered uh, all of your books, I, I, I guess, in sufficient depth. So let's talk a little bit about um, you. Just very quickly, I met you at Marble Mount in um, up on the Highway Two in Washington State. Um, I saw you at the Sasquatch Summit down in Ocean Shores. Unfortunately. I didn't get a chance to talk to you too much. And I just want to ask you if um, we had talked briefly yesterday about, about your plans for the Bigfoot, the Yakima Bigfoot Con. And um, 
And you were mm-hmm. looking, and, and we had decided yesterday that we were going to go together. Will, if you go down there, are you going to speak? Will, will they allow you or, or give you permission to no. speak there? I, I doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay. I, well, the reason I attend those uh, meetings is to meet people. Okay. Okay. And yes, uh, Mel, will, will, he'll give me a table, and I can show my books and get to talk to people all weekend. And that's why I go. Okay. Uh, the summit is always so busy. I see. I never get a chance to to do much because there's eight hundred, nine hundred people there. Mm-hmm. And this year, I got there. I was I was scheduled to be the uh, uh, top speaker, and I love that because your first hour. And you can spend all the time talking to people, uh, but I get there and John, Johnny says, "We have somebody that couldn't make it we do a second presentation mm-hmm. tomorrow." So I had to, I had to put another presentation together. Together, really, he knows that I have thumb drives with, you know, eight or nine or ten different presentations on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, I was an easy one to, one to reach. But then with that many people. I, I'm busy continuously, so it's. I didn't even get a chance to sit and talk to Bob Morton about five minutes, mm-hmm. minutes that that whole weekend because uh, because of how busy it is. Yeah. But it's a wonderful conference. It's great. But we're, uh, we have the uh, uh, the Sasquatch Rendezvous in Aub- Auburn, Washington, coming up the the fourth and fifth of April, and then what two weeks later we go to Yakima. Yeah, I'm gonna have to write that down. This being sponsored by the tribe. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Mel Scan, who's uh, who's spearheading that, is is a tribal member. A uh, great guy, really great guy. Um, and Bob Gimlin will be there, be there too. And mm-hmm. so we will have a great time. Okay. All right. Well, um, so this is Johnny Manson that's doing this. No, Johnny Manson does the uh, Sasquatch, the Summit. Sasquatch Summit in Ocean Shores. Okay. Yeah, that's always always the weekend before Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, I want to. Con- uh, and I wanna- that's sponsored by the the Quinault Tribe. Yeah, I want to contact whoever's doing that Yakima thing. I, I tell them I want Tom Cantrell up doing a presentation. So, um, Tom, before <laughs> just the last thing about your books is you have a. You, you do publishing now, and on Facebook you have RS Publishing. Could you tell us a little bit about what that's about? Well, it it basically I'd like to help other people with their books. Anything if a person's got an idea, anything from just the idea of a book through the finished man, manuscript, I can I can help them. You know, point them in directions to go on how to write their book, how to you know physically do it. Uh, be a bud reader, just you know, read their manuscript, see what I think of it, and and advise them on that. Up to, I do editing, I do uh, 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 proofreading, up to publishing, and I'll I'll publish it for them if, if that's what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started that just simply because I found a way to get my books published to publish them myself mm-hmm. uh, using an inner an internationally system and without costing any money <laughs> okay mm-hmm. uh, which for me is a, is a criteria because I'm retired retired on social security and the place where I live takes all my social security for me living here leaves me with $40 a month so doing things without any money is, has become derriere mm-hmm. uh, so it has to be self, self-supporting mm-hmm. uh, people ask me you know how how do I feel you know you know, making money on my books as well. I make about enough to pay for the ones I give away. Yeah. And if I do make a little bit, it, it gets me to another, another conference or gets me an opportunity to, to see other people and talk to more people. And that's what I need to do. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I'm all about is help helping other people. Yeah. Well, Tom, I'm going to do a, a book about the Olympics and uh, Bigfoot, uh, eventually, I, I, I keep saying I'm going to do it and haven't even started it yet. But when it's when it's in the uh, right stages, I'm going to send it to you for some uh, fact checking and some proofreading. And 
Hopefully, you won't charge okay. me an arm and a leg for my for your services. Well, Tom, we're we've got. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we, go ahead. So I, I work pretty cheap. Okay. First thing you do. This is hint number one. Out, write an outline. Okay. Mm-hmm. What you want? What you want to cover in that book? Yeah. And then. You know, you've got point one, that's going to be chapter one, chapter two. That way you can pick out of your outline, today I want to I want to work on chapter two yeah. and write that story. Uh, tomorrow I feel like doing chapter seven and write that story. Then you can go back and put them all together because you have an, you have an outline. That doesn't mean you're going to follow that outline all the way through. Poor heavens, Ghost of Ruby Ridge took so many 90-degree curves in its writing that it was unreal. Mm-hmm. Real. But... Uh, but at least it gives you a, a basis to work from, yeah. and that's important. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, this will be my eighth, so um, I definitely have been there. And I, I'm like you; I huh. do different kinds of books. I do fiction. I do nonfiction. I so all right. So that's RS Publishing, and um, and just contact uh, Tom through Facebook, and and he'll set you up with his services. So Tom, let's talk uh, again. We're it's it's time. It's always a time factor on this podcast, but I want to talk a little bit about um, your you. I was going to have Jackie Tonk on here uh, with is it Tonk mm-hmm. or Tonks? I always get it wrong. But we, to have you guys talk tonk, about your tonk. yeah. To have you guys talk about your sighting in California, and um, what I heard from Jackie is that your sighting, you guys were driving along, I guess it was around Bluff Creek, and you saw three males. Is that that's correct? Yes. No, 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 no. Nope. It was uh, it was two. Okay. And it was and it was a male and a female. Okay. Okay. But so, yeah, we were driving. We were on the go road heading back. Right. This was the seventeenth of June. 2014, and this is uh, delineated in the uh, in the book 21 Days to Destiny. I tell uh, that the last part of that book uh, book is everything that happened in that camp those 12 days in June in 2014, and uh, we had gone to town to get gas for our for our uh, propane for our heaters tent heaters, and we're coming back. It was late afternoon. Uh, probably about six o'clock. Clock, of course, June. That's the longest, longest days of the year. And came around a curve at milepost fourteen on the go road. And here's two indi- two individuals in the middle of the road, right in front of the car. By the time I got stopped, they were twenty feet in front of us. They turned. They swiveled right in the ro- in the road over the bank, and the bank they went over drops right down into the headwaters of Bluff Creek. They were. We were approximately three miles, miles crow flies from the film site, Patterson Gimlin film site. It was a rough three miles if that crow had to walk and put and put your flat tire, but uh, but it's about three three and a half miles by by air to that site. We got to see them almost. It was almost instant. Arla Williams was with us at the time too. There were three of us in the car, and uh, but like, but like I said, Jackie and I were in the front seats. She was in, she was riding shotgun. I was driving, and uh, I had been pushing. I was it's a, it's thirty four miles back to camp. It takes about a you know well from town where we got the gas. It's two to two and a half hour drive, and I, and I was trying to shorten it to ninety minutes. And but I cut my ro- my teeth driving on those types of roads, so I know how to do it. But it's a lot of acceler- acceleration, acceleration, you know, accelerate, brake. Mm-hmm. Uh, you aren't just idling along, and that's what happened. Came around the curve, and there they were. I came to a stop. They swiveled, went over the bank in front of us, and Jackie, sitting in the <laughs> in the passenger seat, just yelled at the top of her lungs, <laughs> "Big foot!" <laughs> and we we went on, and in the twenty mile miles from where we saw the milepost fourteen back to our camp at milepost thirty four, at the end of the road, she had had herself that she had not seen two Sasquatch standing in the road. She had seen two Mexican drug 
drug mules wearing long haired ghillie suit, backpacks, and flip flops. Why? Because her mind didn't didn't know Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. It these other things and it item by item retreated back to those of those things. Mm-hmm. It was it was fantastic to watch. I, d- I don't know if there's ever been a psychological study done on that, but if there hasn't, there should be. Mm-hmm. It was fascinating to watch the, this evolu- evolution. And finally, it was Arla who said, Jackie, you've, Jackie came over from England for this outing. She says, you've traveled 6,000 mi- miles to see what you saw, and now your mind isn't allowing you to see it. And Jackie got thinking about it, and by the time time I dropped her back at the airport in Portland some days later, she had realized what her mind had done to her and understood that what she'd seen was to Sasquatch. Well, Tom, wait a minute but here. It was a fit. Um, I, I think this opens up a whole, whole new thing. How would Jackie know what a Mexican drug mule would look like? She's from England. and Well, and, because there, there was a lot of there was a lot of conversation in camp uh-huh. Camp about that because that area they grow they grow a lot of uh, uh, illegal marijuana. So and, this is prior. Uh, this is prior to the sighting. Yeah, prior to the sighting. Okay, we had, we had been discussing this. Some okay. of the some of the people had wanted to do an overnighter down into the timber. Back to the remember the uh, uh, incident that I alluded to earlier, where I had the three of them around me all night. Mm-hmm. They wanted wanted to hike that site and the forest service advised them not to because of the drug traffickers that work in that area hmm. so that was that had been dis- and discussed so she was familiar with the problem okay now we were there when we were there it was too early for them it was like i say uh it was freezing at night uh, uh i mean hard freezes at night so they wouldn't have been there but nonetheless that's that was the 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 topic of conversation around the campfire. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just thinking that um, is there something else that they were able to maybe project into her mind that you're not even seeing us, and and that goes into the woo factor. So we don't want to get too far into it. But when I talked to Jackie, the thing that I thought was very interesting is that she said that they you you stop the car. And then they crossed the road into a area that didn't have very much what she called, uh, she said cover, but it's actually technically concealment. They were in basically a bare area. They realized that this is, there's no concealment here. And then they went back the way they came. Is that, is that how it happened? Is, is that, <coughs> that's not the way I, uh, now uh, I'm just finished doing a, uh, a video on, evidence and on eyewitness testimony Mm -hmm. and this is a prime example we're sitting side by side in the front car and we both see it differently Mm -hmm. okay because what i saw was them them spin immediately and go back across Mm -hmm. and uh, what they did the reason they did that is that they continued on it was a very very heavy i mean really heavy brush area Mm -hmm. would have been difficult to navigate but by going back uh, they drop o- drop over that bank. They're out of sight immediately. Okay. Uh, but there again, they we did not surprise them. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was making if you if you've ever been out in an area where where there's a single road and you hear traffic on that road, they heard us coming from mm-hmm. a mile mile away at least mm-hmm. because I was you no know, no we were not idling along. Like I said, I was driving hard. Okay, so I'm making a lot of noise, and I was able to illustrate this a few nights later when we were camped on our way home, and we were within three quarters, three quarters of a mile of a grade on the road that we turned off of to where we wanted to camp, and we could hear every car that went up that grade. Okay, yeah, the same, th- same thing. <coughs> they were waiting for us. They were waiting for us. They knew we were coming, and they were on that road to sh- to show themselves to us. I have no doubt of that in my, in my mind whatsoever. 
Okay, but any any reason why they'd want to do that? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, as they dis- they disappeared over the bank, in my mind, there again, tele- telepathy mm-hmm. came. I'm the one you know as Patty. This is this mm. is my son. That's why that. That's why they did it. Wow. So that would. Okay. So, you know, you you're expert enough to to know. I mean, did did she did she match the height? Did she? And she'd obviously have to be very old she was now. In, in her ninth decade. Okay. So, but mm-hmm. she. But but is physically? Did she look like the one on the on the film? More more gray. Yeah. Okay. More that, gray, and he's not quite. He's he's more human looking than she is. Wow. Okay. Well, that's uh, Tom. With the, just our, I think we are almost on an hour and a half now, so we're going to have to tie this off very quickly. But let's go back to this idea of the hybrid versus the 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 purebred, and we talked about this in the beginning. And do you, from what you know? Um, do you think that the hybrid has more of an ability to use telepathy and what you'd call the woo factor than, than one of these, did I say hybrid? I mean the full bread. Um, do you think there's a full bread and do you think they have more powers than a hybrid? I think they're all one species. You Homo don't sapiens cognati. Okay. Period. So there's there's okay, just like we're we're all one. We're Homo sapiens sapiens, mm-hmm. wise wise man. They're Homo sapiens cognati, which is no which one. is uh, wise man related on our mother's side. Okay, okay, that is their official scientific name. Okay, it's registered with GenBank. Okay, then I will uh, I will tell that, that said, to my brothers. Th- that said, there are. Variations, just like there's variations in us. You and I don't look like somebody that's raised in Rwanda. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't look don't look like raised in Hunan. We don't look like somebody raised in Vladivostok. Mm-hmm. But we're all the same species. Okay. Yeah. That's that. Now, are there differentiations? Yes, there are. Uh, and again, I alluded to that earlier. Earlier, that class of individual that I call a teacher, I, I think, have much higher capabilities than the, you know, the the uh, society in general does. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where the telepathy, the and the, you know, I don't know if being is part of that or not, but I'm fairly sure. The telepathy is because I have had instances where, where they could not communicate by telepathy, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think that was general uh, population versus the the elite uh, teacher class, mm-hmm. and I know they can. So Tom, how, how are they? How are they elite teachers? Uh, is do you is the, are we ruling out the fact that they could uh, breed with humans and that some of these are our hybrids we're looking at is that out of the picture right now i didn't say that okay it is to me they are all human hybrids okay their mother is human okay but how do you explain the difference in height for for instance or color how do how how do i explain the difference in height between shaquille o'neal and uh peewee herman yeah just okay. different. It's variations. Yeah. Okay. Different strokes for different for different folks. I was going to say that you know, great minds do think alike. It's it proven right here <laughs> on Encounters USA. All right. Well, Tom, uh, just a few more minutes. I, I just want to ask you. Um, you've so you've worked in a bunch of. You've worked in three or more different areas, and um, all those areas have had. Uh, you like them because they have Bigfoot activity. 
from your experience, are these the same? I don't want to say tribe, but you know, you've got different family groups. That's that's a given with any species. So I, when you're talking about the Blue Mountains, I call them clans. Okay, are they clans in the blue? Is, it, is there a Blue Mountain clan, an Olympic clan, a California there clan? Three, there are three clans in the Blue Mountains. Okay, mountains. Uh, there are two on the Olympic Peninsula. Okay. In the state of Washington, there are 20 to 22 clans. So there's a couple of a couple of them that go back and forth across borders that, uh, you know, I don't know whether to include them or not. Each clan consists of some, oh, 15 to 18 individu- individuals, which puts the population in the state of Washington at about 300 individuals. Mm-hmm. Okay. Every state in the country, with the exception of Hawaii, has population. Okay, I have not seen a confirmed, reliable report on population in Hawaii. And it might be logistics of getting there that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I have been face-to-face with them in Alaska, the 11 western states, uh, in Oklahoma, and in, and in Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, they're and they're and they're virtually the same individual with regional variations. White-tailed deer, a white-tailed deer in Texas, same same species as a white-tailed deer in Minnesota, but the white-tailed deer in Minnesota is going to be twice the size of the one in Texas on the average. Mm-hmm. Yep, regional variation. Yep. Okay, and uh, same species but regional variations. Okay. That's very easy to confuse use with the different species, and it's not so. Okay. And the I guess we're going to have to kind of uh, close this off a little bit, but um, I just I think I know what your answer is, but is there a connection to the the politis missing four one one and Bigfoot? No. No, Bigfoot's not taking this. Uh, 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 ask, ask David Pilates. From day one, that these have nothing to do with Bigfoot, nothing to do with Sasquatch. That idea comes comes from the population reading those books. Mm-hmm. I've had people was you know say to me, "Well, he wrote books about Sasquatch, so this has to be the same way." Mm-hmm. I said, "I said no. I wrote books about Mountain Man, and I write books about Sasquatch. Doesn't mean they're the same at all." Okay, uh, same thing there. The people he's talking about going missing are in rugged country. I can tell you a small story it happened in Wakayakum County, Washington. Washington. A young man went missing. They sent out search parties, could not find him. Okay, two years later, he he was found accidentally, actually by um, a seer, somebody who, who had a vision. And he had tripped, fallen, and rolled rolled under the edge of a glacier. Okay? Unless she had seen him and knew where he had fallen, he would have, ne- would have never been. Same thing there. Mm-hmm. These people are in very rugged uh, country. If you fall off of one of those trails in places, places it's two feet before you touch the ground again. Mm-hmm. Now, I understand. East of the Rocky Mountains, people don't understand this. I mean, the highest elevation, elevation east of the Rocky Mountains, is like the foothills behind my house. Okay, uh, we're talking here seven, eight, nine, and we have to go to fourteen over fourteen thousand feet. Go to Alaska, you got peaks to go to over twenty three thousand feet. Whole different story. So easy to injure yourself and go missing just that fast and it doesn't take anybody or anything else to cause the problem now add to that these same Mexican drug dealers I say Mexican these same people growing pot growing drugs mm-hmm. drugs put them into the equation and now you've got a danger attitude yeah. to combat as well I tell people you know people yeah, I 
one of my things is the aggressive or dangerous Sasquatch. I tell people, I'm 76 years old. Be 77 on the 1st of, 1st of July. If you think you have a dangerous or aggressive Sasquatch, call me. I'll come stand between you and them. Hmm. Okay? Unless, unless you're in a place and they want you out of that place, mm-hmm. they're not aggressive. They're not dangerous. Okay? Most of this is attitude. If a, if a person goes into the woods expecting to see a monster, when they see one, they're going to see a monster. Because mm-hmm. that's what their mind will let them see, just like Jackie. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, they so, are not an aggressive species. All right. So Bigfoot, according to Tom Cantrell, no involvement with the missing 411 then? No, no. Okay. Totally different subject. Okay. All right. Well, it, it is a big mystery and one of those mysteries that hopefully we'll be able to to solve relatively soon. So, Tom, um, so you're going to be at the Auburn Sasquatch thing. Are you going to that? I am. As a matter of fact, I have two speaking engagements. So that's at the uh, Sasquatch Rendezvous, Rendezvous Sasquatch. In, uh, in Auburn on 4th and 5th of, of April. Okay. Um, on Saturday, I'm going to be, I, I, they told me to tell my story. I don't talk about myself very well i'll be truthful with you it's not my favorite subject uh, i don't like like being on the limelight i like to talk about sasquatch and it will probably devolve into that very quickly uh, sunday i am going to talk about about some of the woo want to talk about some of the healing that's been done to me and you can call it woo or you can call it whatever you want all i do is tell what happened you can decide what it was it was it cost mm-hmm. uh, and I'm going to tell it as it happened to me as I saw it. Does that mean that's exactly 100% true? No, it means it's how, it's how I looked at it, how I saw it. Just like Jackie and I watching that same thing happen and seeing slightly different versions of it. That's what eyewitnesses do. Mm-hmm. That's why a single eyewitness in a criminal trial is not reliable. Mm-hmm. You need to have corroboration between eyewitnesses to to get the true picture of what happened because we do things dependent on our own experience mm-hmm. now I like to think mine is probably better better than most I have had so much experience and they don't scare me somebody asked me one time here very recently doesn't anything in the woods scare you yes yes when I see a boot track that I can't identify and don't know why they're there mm-hmm. that can scare the hell out of me but nothing that lives there yeah, bears are not scary if you use common sense. Now, a grizzly, you have to be very careful. You know, a grizzly can change a simple walk to the outhouse into the adventure of a lifetime <laughs> just by being. There. But black bears, they're more of a pest than anything. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've sneaked sneaked in on them to within almost touching range and not had any problem. But there again, don't get between a sow and her cub. Mm-hmm. Cub, you know, are you going to have problems? Mm-hmm. Don't fool with a two-year-old male. Are you going to have problems? Mm-hmm. You can have problems. All right, Tom. You we'll... have to pay attention to what you're doing. All right. Well, that is just uh, fantastic advice, and I have really enjoyed uh, our conversation. And I could go on for at least a couple more hours because there's so many more things i'd like to pick your brain about but um we'll see you down at the auburn conference and i think we agreed yesterday um unless we can get some more attractive uh young lady to give you a ride over to yakima um i think you and i are going to be doing (laughs) or going to be heading over there ourselves so so that'll be very interesting we'll be able i think go ahead i think i'm safer traveling with you (laughs) <laughs> well, you never know. You you don't know. You really don't know. Um, I've never had an accident, but uh, anyway, um, and, I, and actually, I'm a very safe driver, so I don't think you have anything to worry about. Um, but if there are anybody, is there if anybody's interested in uh, taking Tom? Uh, he's in Enumclaw, and he would uh, need a ride to Yakima. And um, I will not be offended if it is some. Uh, young attractive fan or not so attractive whatever but somebody who'd like to help tom out and and get to know him that's just oh, great 
And Tommy, you're single, right? I, I'm like Bob Gibb. Yeah, I am single, and I'm like Bob in that respect. Uh, we like we like to talk to ladies, but uh, but we're pretty pretty you're, harmless. Well, I've seen you both in action, <laughs> and you're both masters at the craft. <laughs> So, well, all right, Tom Cantrell, it has really been an honor uh, being able to talk to you and listening to some of your wisdom. And, you know, I have so many more things that I'd really like to talk to you about. And one thing that we have in common is that we're both uh, LDS or Mormons. And um, so uh, I've heard you mention some things about... uh, the Bigfoot connection to uh, Latter-day Saints. And so that's another topic we need to mm-hmm. uh, pick up on at some time. But I think that's going to get so far woo. Um, I'm not sure how many people would actually be interested outside of the church. But uh, anyway, it's a it's a fascinating topic. And to share what I know with what you know, it, is. Um, it would be, uh, I think it'd be eye-opening for you. So so later on, Let's we'll, we'll pick it, it up. Sometime. Yeah. Well, all right, Tom. Well, right. thanks again for being on the show. Do you have any uh, last words of wisdom? Come see us at uh, at Auburn at the rendezvous. If you can't get there, come to Yakima. If you can't get there, come to to uh, Marble Mountain over Labor Day. That that's going to be a fun one again. Oh, we mm-hmm. had such a great time last year. Yep. Savella did just a great job of hosting it, and uh, she's going to do it again this year. Okay, and I, de- I definitely uh, I will Dr. be there. I think Doctor Rob, I think Doctor Rob Alley's going to be there as well. Uh, he wrote Range Coast Sasquatch and Western Southeast Alaska. Mm-hmm. Uh, great guy, great teacher. Yep. You know, that's another guy, because I lived in Alaska also, and I we didn't get a chance to talk about your encounters. I talked to Dr. Ali, and he wanted me to interview him. I, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to do it. And so I, I, I still need to pick that up. So, yeah, he's very fascinating. So I, I definitely want to talk to him about Alaska Bigfoot, as well as yourself. Uh, really mm-hmm. quickly, where did you see a Bigfoot in Alaska? In the Panhandle? Prince of Wales. Prince okay. of Wales Island. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was up in Wasilla I'm and on the Anchorage. North of Prince of Wales out. Wow, amazing. All right, mm-hmm. well, let's not let's let, we got to tie this off. So we will talk about this in the All next right. interview. All right. Well, Tom Cantrell, thanks for um joining us on Encounters USA and as we always say, if you are out in the woods, if you're down in Enumclaw with Tom Cantrell or at the Yakima Bigfoot Con or the Auburn Sasquatch I don't know what the name is. Remember, always watch your back. Thanks for joining us on Encounters USA. Remember, if you have comments, please leave them in the comment section on YouTube and hit that subscribe button and ring that bell while you're at it. Don't forget, if you'd like to be a guest on Encounters USA, just send us an email at EncountersUSA numeral one at gmail.com and just put podcast guest in the subject line now please remember that all of the guests opinions on encounters usa are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the podcast host nor the podcast sponsors so thank you and don't forget when you're out in the woods Looking for aliens, Bigfoot, or Dogman? Always watch your back.